Hi folks, let's focus on controlling the 2D adaptive toolpath in this video. And let's do two things. Let's show how we can create an adaptive strategy to machine out this inside pocket here, but leave ourselves a slug of raw material. And we'll talk about some best practices when it comes to actually machining that. And let's fix this toolpath because let's say we're holding this workpiece right here and right here. So we don't want that adaptive toolpath to crash with our work holding. We just wanna machine these four corners in an adaptive strategy one at a time. Welcome to another Fusion Friday. So to create the adaptive on this interior pocket, 2D adaptive clearing, and I can jump into geometry and I'll pick that interior pocket. Just click OK, and we're, we're going to get a toolpath, but remember, 2D Adaptive doesn't care about the solid model. It just goes where you tell it. In this case, because I picked this circle or this contour, and it put the red line on the inside, notice if I click it, it would flip to the outside, but I'm gonna click it to leave it on the inside. It's gonna machine through everything, including that center island like so. So we restrain or contain that toolpath by editing under geometry and we click this edge right here and notice it put the red arrow on the correct side. Fusion usually does a really good job at this, but now we're gonna get an error. We're gonna get a problem. So when you get stumped on 2D adaptives or any Fusion 360 problem, head on over to the new NYC CNC website. If you go under Fusion 360, Cam, why is 2D Adaptive not generating a toolpath? A free video that walks through the most common reasons you may be having a problem with toolpath containment or toolpath errors in Fusion 360. We've also got a variety of other Fusion 360 tips, tricks, and tutorial videos on everything from CAD to CAM to lay the sheet metal to patch environment and more. So why aren't we getting a toolpath? Let's take a quick look at our diameters here. Hit I on your keyboard. So that is a 6.7 diameter inch circle. Large is 6.7. Small is 5.6. So the difference is 1.1 inches. So that's diameter. <clears throat> Radius is just half that. So the radius is 0.55 inches. So you would think we're using a half inch tool. That means the tool should fit but two problems. One, it fits but barely. Fusion Adaptive wants usually a fair amount of room for the tool to move, and if we have a 0.5 inch tool that has to fit into a 0.55 inch slot, it only has 25 thousandths on each side for it to move. So that's the number one problem. However, we can get this to work. Let's, so let's fix the real problem, which is linking the helical ramp diameter. What it's trying to do is ramp in on a diameter that's 0.475. So what does that mean? Let's do a quick sketch. So 0.475 circle. Let's create our half inch tool on it. So what it's trying to do is it's trying to move that around that area, which means the diameter that I need for that to fit in is this big. I need an almost one inch diameter hole or cavity for it to make that ramp diameter work. So first off, let's just fix this to, to ensure that we've got the problem solved. Edit, linking, change the ramp type to plunge. I do not recommend you machine it this way. What I'm trying to do now is problem solve and get this toolpath fixed. So we still don't have a toolpath. Here's the other common culprit when you have an adaptive problem passes minimum cutting radius. Remember what we just said? If the tool is 0.5 inches and it's trying to cut inside a 0.55 inch slot, that's only a 25 thou on each side. So again, let's just take this out of play by bringing it down to say 1,000th of an inch. I bet you we get a toolpath now, but it's not gonna be a great toolpath. You can see it's gonna take a long time to calculate. If you expand it, you can watch the kilobytes of the actual toolpath file size building up and you can see I've got a pretty fast computer now. We just upgraded to one of the HP uh, Z2s. 
In fact, that's one of the other things I like about the new NYC CNC website is lets us have a place to explain things like, hey, here are the computers that we recommend and that we use for Fusion 360, whether you're on a budget or whether you're going for a high-end system. So we can see that's going to work, but we need to make some improvements. So the first thing I'm going to do here is suggest that we reduce to a 3 8 inch diameter tool. So let's go to tool, add a tool, and we'll say flat end mill 0.375. And for now, we'll just click OK. Click OK, and now we're going to get a much better tool path. And when I say that, I mean that Fusion can generate it much, much faster. The machine is going to handle it better because remember, machines don't go from 0 to 100% speed or feed rate instantly. There's a ramp up and a ramp down or an acceleration and a deceleration, whether you're on a Tormach or whether you're on a Haas or whether you're on the world's best vertical machining center. So letting the machine make a more fluid motion where it's able to get up to speed is much better than having really tight circles where it's never going to get there. You're also going to have better chip evacuation, less of a slotting action, etc. Last thing I would do now that we're done is I would either pre-drill this or I would do a ramp. Let's go over both options. So to pre-drill it, I would go into model. Let's turn on our sketches. This is a customer part and see if we've got a sketch that helps us. Not really. C for circle. And I want this circle to bisect uh, the two diameters. So if we look at what they were the average of those two is 6.15, 6.15. I'll click on it once and hit X. And now I can do sketch point. And I'll put a point here. And just to make it nice and tidy, we'll do horizontal vertical and we'll make sure that hole is directly at 12 o'clock. Stop sketch under cam. What we can now do is drill, select drill. We, should, we can actually drill this out with a half inch drill. So I'll pick a half inch drill. And under geometry, this is the trick. Change from selected faces to selected points. I'll click that point. And under heights, I need to check the bottom height. Not as the whole bottom because that's a little bit of a bad name because we did a, did a point, but it thinks that the hole is only exists right at that point is we want to go all the way through our part so i'll have to say stock bottom with drill tip through bottom click ok that's going to drill our hole which is great now what we need to do is reorder that put it above our adaptive and then change the adaptive by editing it linking pre-drill positions click that point the downside of this method is it takes a, a tool change. However, it is my preferred method, especially in this case, because this slot is 0.8 inches deep, but only 0.55 wide. So it's, you know, one and a half to two times the diameter. So I would rather drill it than interpolate it out, but we can interpolate it out. I'll duplicate, edit, and under linking, we can delete the pre-drill, go back to a ramp, or helix rather, and what we'll say is the helical ramp diameter, so we can use our sketch to tell us what that needs to be. So if that was 0 0.2, nope, 0.1, nope, 0 0.07, not even there yet. We're, we need this to be under 0.55 for it to work. That's pretty obvious. Excuse me while I do basic math here, but 0 0.04 plus 0 0.5 is the 0.54. Sorry about that, folks. I should have thought of that. One of those things that's tempting to edit out. Uh, ramp diameter of 0 0.054. Oh, I had to delete the pre-drill. Sorry about that. That's important, though. Click OK, and so it's now going to spiral or ramp into it. So if you do this, you've got to be careful. You will likely, uh, it would be easy, I should say, to build up chips, especially on the face of that tool. Most end mills don't have, I think it's called the gash or the proper face relief to really evacuate chips, especially when you get down in there because you're not making a very big hole as you go down. So again, it's very easy to damage a tool. So I'd much prefer to drill it or you could switch to an even smaller tool that would let you do a wider slot to open it up more to help something like a fog buster blow those chips out. Last thing I would do is, this is a customer file, great example. I give them a kudos for, for getting in this far. You don't have to build this solid piece in the center. Let's show you a better way to do this. 
hop back into model, and I'll turn this body off for now just to show what we can do. C for circle, click here. We just need a sketch. So let's say we want to try to save a five inch slug. And let's sketch. Let's sketch this just to see what that is as well. So 6.7, five inches. You know, this would be a great example of doing this if it was an expensive piece of material and you wanted to save this to rework it for another job. Great example of, of what to do. So you could control the diameter with a sketch. And under cam, what we can do is just update that toolpath to be the outside edge and that edge. Just make sure when we use a sketch, Fusion doesn't always understand what side we're trying to work on. In this case, I've got to flip the red arrow over. And I picked sketches on the top plane here. See that? So it's, it misunderstands the height. No big deal. Edit, heights. Bottom height is not the selected contour anymore, but rather model bottom. Last trick, probably one of the most important though to mention, if you're actually going to do this, don't, don't, don't do this. Because what will happen is when you cut through at the very end, that relatively large five inch piece of material, which has some mass and weight, is gonna start banging around and it's potentially going to break your tool and it's almost certainly also going to damage your part. You don't want it to become this flying object. So let's adjust this adaptive under the heights, and instead of model bottom, let's say about 10 thou up. I would be comfortable going even lower. You just gotta be careful you've got your stock measured correctly. So we're gonna stay 10 thou up. Now that alone would work. You could probably take this piece and just push the center part out and it would tear out on its own, depending on the material when you're done. Or we can do a cool trick, which is 2D contour. Let's use that sketch that we just made. It's on the center line of the two. And now what we'll do is we'll do model bottom. We'll say negative 10 thou to go below our part. So let's simulate it to take a look. We'll drill the hole. We'll do the adaptive all the way around it. And note that that adaptive doesn't go all the way through. So we've got that floor material supporting this center slug. That way, again, it doesn't become a little missile. Then, after we've done the adaptive, we're gonna take a 2D contour with a couple tricks that I'll show you, and go ahead and poke all the way through and walk around it. That means when it gets to this last tail point here and the part becomes free, the sidewalls of both the slug and the workpiece aren't gonna be banging against our tool. So the trick on the 2D contour, and we're actually gonna change one more thing, is no lead in and lead out. And under passes, we're actually taking the compensation type to off because I want that to act like a trace or a slot where the tool is running right on center. If we normally leave it in computer, it's gonna offset the tool to the right or the left. That's normally how we cut. So we'll turn it off. The one more trick, awesome underused feature in my opinion, tabs. Let's leave at distance, let's see here, let's leave three tabs. This is awesome. Now, uh, they don't even need to be that big. Tab width 0.125. Now when you're done, take a look. It's still holding on to that slug. It doesn't become loose at all with three little points. Awesome. Last trick. How do we fix this adaptive so that it doesn't machine all the way around the part, but rather just the four corners? The problem with this, or what happened is that if we look at our setup, stock, it's relative size box, but it's adding 40 thousandths of stock side offset. So if we zoom in, we can see it's given us a little bit of extra material right here around our part, which is a fair assumption if we were trying to machine this up. So the adaptive sees that material and says, I need to machine that away. Well, in this case, you just want to do the four corners. The easy way to fix it would be no additional stock, and that would work. But that would flow through all of the cam operations. And sometimes you want there to be some additional stock because you may want to do an adaptive or a different strategy later that reflects that. But you can just see here that fixed it. So how do we do this without changing our stock? We'll go back to add stock, click OK. 
Let's hop, hop back into model. Sketch, create sketch on this plane. I'm gonna do S for a keyboard shortcut, pop up, center. I'm gonna pick center a rectangle, click right here, click here, and I'll have coincident that line with that. I gotta hit P for project, there we go. Coincident that and that. We just created a rectangle around our part that is the exact same size. What that lets us do in CAM for this 2D adaptive, again, right now it's back to having 40,000 additional stock. So it's gonna walk around our part and that would crash into our vise or our clamps. Edit the 2D adaptive, geometry, stock contours, and pick that line that we just made. Zoom in, pick this black line. That tightens in the stock, click OK, and it's now just going to do the four corners. You could do a similar method or technique uh, to machine, say, just one of these or two or three of them at a time to control how your tool moves and to make sure you avoid work holding clamps, fixtures, etc. Thanks for watching, folks. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something. See you next Friday.